So in week number one, we looked at uh, just the name, his name, Holy Spirit. Some of your Bibles say Holy Ghost, and we found out he's not a ghost, right? He's not a spook or something. Uh, Really, his name just literally means a breath. It means the breath of God. It means the breath of fresh air. And all he wants to do is refresh you, empower you. He wants to blow wind into your cells. Like he wants to be with you and he's nothing to be afraid of. And so we we discovered that in week number one. In week number two, we found out that the Holy Spirit is the giver of the gifts, that that it's the the spiritual gifts and the confusion around spiritual gifts. So we kind of said that the spiritual gifts are, are, are what God gives to his children so that they can serve like Jesus. And in last week, um, Pastor Sean Tobiasen was here, our Northwest Campus pastor. I was at downtown campus preaching the same message. I heard he did pretty good. We're going to keep him around, guys? Keep him around? Yeah, I think we should keep him. We're going to keep him for a little bit. But uh, we talked about Pentecost and what is Pentecost and why Pentecost. And there's another, there's another term that, that there's a lot of confusion about. And so we kind of, we, we, we backed it up a little bit and, and really taught you guys the like the, the Jewish tradition and the custom and the ceremonies of those, the three major ones of the Jewish law. And uh, it kind of loses its meaning for us and our tradition and our culture here. But uh, Pentecost meant something very different for Jesus and the Jewish people. And we found out that Pentecost really it was a cel- They celebrated that day to remember the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. That, Mo- that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God on tablets of stone. But the, we found out that Jesus was a fulfillment. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. And we found out that, that God no longer writes the laws on tablets of stone. He writes them on the tablets of our hearts. So we, we, we don't have to like, uh, you know, obey something outwardly and try really hard. He changes us from the inside out. That's what, that's what Pentecost means. It's the power to make a difference. It's the power to be changed. Now, today I want to dispel another myth with another term that there's a lot of confusion, uh, maybe lack of understanding about, and that's the, that's the term baptism. And immediately when I say it, your, your minds probably go to water, water baptism. But in your Bible, baptism, baptism, it literally means um, up here on the screen, not in your notes, to be immersed in, to be like fully uh, uh, submerged and immersed in. And in fact, the, the Bible has three baptisms. It tells us there are three baptisms for us. Like every one of them are for us, meaning that there are three separate immersion experiences that God wants for you. Like his journey for your life, listen, includes three immersions, all right? And, and there's, there's a lot of lack of understanding in this area, so let's jump into this. Uh, what are the three baptisms? And again, I'm just peeling it back so you can see. You can see how important the journey of God, just like we did last week. So let me give them to you, the three baptisms. If you're taking notes, you guys, the first one is when we are baptized into the body of Christ. When we're baptized into the body of Christ. And this is, for you extra note takers, write the word salvation. Write the word salvation next to that, because that's what that is. So this, listen, your salvation experience, it isn't religion. All right, it's, it's not when you decided to go to church. It's not when you decided to, to, to join a church. All right, check this out. Your baptism, your, your salvation was always intended to be an immersion into a relationship with not only Jesus Christ, but with his church, with the body of Christ. Okay, this is so important to understand, you guys. I want to be very clear. Salvation was always intended to be a vibrant, authentic passionate relationship. It wasn't supposed to be like a two Sunday a month deal where we go somewhere and do something. Like your faith, your Christianity was always meant to be this vibrant, passionate immersion into a relationship with Jesus Christ and his body. Let me show you some scriptures that explain this. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13 says, for we are, we are all baptized by one spirit. And I love that it points out that the, that the Holy Spirit is the one who baptizes us into Jesus. There's another scripture that actually says that when you came to Christ, when you got saved, it wasn't because of a good preacher or good music or worship or any of that stuff. It was because the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to you. That's, that's, that's what happened. The Holy Spirit did. So he says, we're all baptized by one spirit into what? Into one body. Let me show it to you in Galatians. Same concept, Galatians chapter three. It says, you are all sons and daughters. If you're a Christian, you are a son and daughter of God. Well, how? One way, through faith in Jesus Christ. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself 
with Christ. So he's not talking about the water one right there. That's talking about when you become a believer, that you're baptized, you are immersed into the body of Christ. All right, let me show you another one that's not in your notes because I ran out of room and I am going to get a little teachy today and then we'll get preachy on the back end, but I need to just dive into this, you guys. I really want you to understand this stuff. Let me show you the first people who experienced the first baptism, and that would have been the early disciples. John chapter 20 tells us a story. Let me set it up. This, in, in John chapter 20, Jesus had not yet ascended. So it was after Easter, and it was, in, it was in, in that 50-day time period you learned about last week, Pentecost. It was in that 50-day time period where Jesus was showing up on the scene before he ascended to heaven. John chapter 20, verse 19 says, On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, and I love that little detail because John was like, hey, dude, we locked the doors. I'm serious. Like, there, I checked. They were locked, okay? Because he said it was for fear of the Jews. But Jesus came in and stood among them, like, pop, there he is, and freaked everybody out, right? Right? If you were in that room, freak out factors at 10, right? Ah, so, okay, right? And so that's why Jesus says in the next, the next words he says is, peace be with you. And that wasn't Jesus being all poetic and like, oh, good tidings and peace. No, they were freaking out. He was like, chill, peace. Peace, calm down, you guys, calm down. That's what's happening in that scene right there. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Okay, he said, let me show you the holes in my, my hands and where the nail went in. Let me show you where the spear pierced me. Is it you, Jesus? Yeah, it's me. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, chill out. Okay, I know you're excited. Chill out. Peace be with you because I got something you need to hear. I need you to settle down a bit because there's a detail. He's like, there's a detail I need you to see. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And with that, the Bible says, he breathed on them. Now, what do you think the word breathe is right there? Week number one, pneuma. Okay, Jesus did not go. (gasps) That's not what he did. That's not what, okay. It it literally means that, that he imparted the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit onto them. The, he, ga- he gave them the pneuma. That's why it says, and he said, receive the pneuma. Receive the Holy Spirit. So at this moment, the disciples got saved. Okay, you say, wait a second. They weren't they already saved? They've been walking with Jesus for three years? No, they, had, they weren't. You know why? Because sins had not yet been paid for. That's why. So yes, they were disciples. Yes, they were followers of Jesus. They were not yet saved because sins had not yet been paid for. So they became, and I think rightly so, the first converts at that moment. And let me share with you an important detail, you guys, because when you get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. If there is any tradition that says, oh, we're the spirit for ones. We have the spirit. You don't have the spirit. That is a lie, okay? If you are a Christian, you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit, okay? So he says, all right, receive the Holy Spirit. But what's really, whenever you're looking at the Gospels, especially again with things that you want to learn a little bit more about, and you're, you're looking at words of Jesus and stuff, it's really good, a good practice to look at the other Gospels of the same account that happened. You guys you remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's four Gospel accounts. There's four kind of eyewitness records of, of Jesus' ministry and, and life, death, resurrection here on earth, and, they, and, and they all give different details because they're different perspectives, so it's really cool to look at maybe someone else's perspective. And I want to show you Luke, because Luke, um, in his detail and account of this story, the same story, he gives an added detail that I think is just really important. Jesus said in Luke 24, 49, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. Notice the future tense there. It hasn't happened yet. Well, wait a minute. I thought they had just received the Holy Spirit. Hold that thought. But stay in the city until you have been, again, hasn't happened yet, not filled, but clothed, baptized, immersed in the power from on high. So Luke, Luke wrote the book, he wrote the book of Luke, but he also wrote the book of Acts. And again, now if we go to, in in Acts chapter one, the same story, the same account, he adds yet some more details to this story. I just want you to see the, the, the picture of what is happening here when the Holy Spirit is given. Acts chapter 1, verse 3, Luke says this, after his sufferings, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Which ones? Well, remember, he said, look at my hands, look at my side, that kind of stuff. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, and he spoke about the kingdom of God. And on one occasion, 
Which occasion was that? Well, the occasions we just read. John 20, Luke chapter 24, that's the same one. While he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days, notice future tense again, it hasn't happened yet, but you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Well, wait a minute, I thought they were already baptized. No, no, that was just the first baptism, all right? In the first baptism, you have the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but they were not yet baptized and immersed in the Holy Spirit. I liken it like this, like if you were to take a drink of water, you got the water inside of you, right? But if you were to go visit the ocean and walk on into the ocean, you you got water around you. Your water's not in you, it's around you. It's all over you. So, so, for, so when you got saved, you, you took a drink of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's living inside of you. But being baptized and fully immersed in the Holy Spirit is like that water inside you encompass your entire being. And you are now not, not, not water in you, but you're in the water. You're in the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. So that's the first baptism. The second baptism is, is what a lot of you are more familiar with, and that is, write it down, water baptism. Water baptism is not with salvation. Water baptism is a separate experience, and let me tell you why that's important. Because if you had to be water baptized to be saved, in other words, if it went together, if like, I, I, you know, I confess Jesus and I got to get baptized, then you would then be doing a work to earn your salvation, and you can't earn it. It's free. It is by faith, through grace, end of story. There is not, this is a separate immersion experience that God has for you. Now, some people, this is important because some people say, no, well, if you ain't baptized, then you're not saved. I mean, if you, you, you confess with your mouth, but you got to get baptized. And, unless you get, and I'm telling you, that's just dead wrong. That's just wrong. That is not biblical. In fact, some people go as far to say that unless the pastor says the, the right words when you're being baptized, then you're going to hell. You ain't going to hell. You're going to hell. I'm serious. That is so ridiculous. Are you kidding me? The dude, like I believe, but the dude said the wrong words and I'm going to go to hell. Like, I'm getting baptized. Here I am. I'm getting baptized. I get dunked in the water. I don't even know what he's saying. I don't know what he's saying, but I come out of the water. And because he, so I get to heaven. I'm like, all right, Jesus, I'm ready to come in. And Jesus goes, oh, man, I'm so sorry. He don't mess it up. <laughs> man, I wish I could, but he said the wrong words. Come on, that does not happen. That's not how, that's not how it works, you guys. This separate baptism, it doesn't save you. It just declares that you already are saved, okay? I call it the wedding band of Christianity. Now, listen, some of you have already experienced the first baptism. Some of you, you're, you're saved. You have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You're, you're in the family of God. You're in, the, you're in the church. You're part of the church family. But you still have yet to take that next step. That, ne- that next, and I'm telling you, it's a very important step. It's an, a very important part of the journey that God has for you to you be immersed. Uh, in fact, in 27 times in the New Testament, right after someone believed, they were baptized. Right after. One of the experiences in Acts 2.41, it says those who accepted his message were baptized. That was the next thing. They accepted it, and they were baptized. You say, why, Jason? Why is this important? Because your faith, listen, your faith, it begins as a private decision, but God always intended it to go public. Okay? He always intended that thing not to remain private, but it needs to go public. It's, it's the same reason why you have a wedding ceremony and not just a wedding. It's the same reason why you wear a wedding band. Like this wedding band. It, this wedding band does not make me married, right? This wedding band just, just shows all you ladies back off. You know what I mean? That's what it shows. I know that's what some of you are thinking. Back up, Okay. <laughs> I'm taken. You know what I mean? That's what it, that's what it shows. No, no, no. This doesn't, this doesn't make me married. You know what makes me married is the decision I made in my heart. My wife and I, the decision that we made, the covenant that we made to love, honor, cherish till death do us part. That's what makes us married. It's that decision. It's that covenant that we made. This is just a representation. You see, baptism is, is that evidence. It's that outward public evidence. You know what baptism does? It tells the devil, hey, devil, I belong to somebody. I belong to Veronica. I've made a decision in my heart, and this right here just shows the world. And what baptism does, you say, devil, I belong to Jesus. You got nothing for me. Hey, world, no, no, no. I'm not part of you anymore. I have been called out. I belong to Jesus. I am taken. Amen? Amen. That's what baptism represents. It's just the, the, it doesn't save you. It's just the public declaration that you have already been saved. And it's an important step. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10. 
verse 32 and 33. He says, whoever acknowledges me before man, like, like whoever just goes public with that thing, man, I'm going to acknowledge you, he says, before my Father in heaven. But who, whoever disowns me, whoever tries to just keep this a private thing, and then, then I'm going to disown you before my Father in heaven. And that's why I'm telling you, it's my joy to inform you there is another step. There is, there is part of the journey. Like there is another immersion where, where yes, you are immersed into the, to the relationship and body of Christ, but there is another one where God calls you to go public with your, with your faith. And we offer it every other month here at Discovery Church. But there is, a, there is a third baptism. There is a third immersion that God has for you. And it's our subject of conversation today. And that is, write it down, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So you have the Holy Spirit um, if you're saved, but there is a baptism in the Holy Spirit. And this is where thing kind of, things kind of get confusing because of traditions and experiences and um, you know upbringing and the packaging and stuff like that was weird and crazy and goofy and turned a lot of us kind of off. And it's like, you know what? A lot of people are like, you know, I'll stick with the first baptism. I mean, I like that. I, I believe I'll be saved, and I, maybe even I'll do the second baptism. But I think I'll stop right there. I don't want that. I don't want that third one, you know. And, and by the way, you would be somewhat correct. You know, all you need to go to heaven is Jesus. That's all you need. All you need is Jesus to go to heaven. But but listen, church, I'm just trying to convince you today that there is more. There is more than just going to heaven one day. There is so much more to your life. Like God has more, an immersion experience that he wants for you. It's part of the journey. So let me show you. There are so many stories I could have given you, but for the sake of time, let me just give you one story where all three of the baptisms that God desires for you show up in one story as separate experiences. You ready for it? Acts chapter 8. In your notes, I kind of begin at 14, but let me back up to give you context up here on the screens. In Acts chapter 8, verse 5. It says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria. So just like Paul, he's a church planter. And what he was doing there, he was proclaiming that Jesus Christ. He was proclaiming the Christ there. And it says, but when they were, when they believed, that's the first baptism. When they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were, second baptism, baptized in water, both men and women. So now back up to the verse in your notes. If you want to follow along here, verse 14, now when it says headquarters heard about it. So when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent the big dogs, Peter and John, to them. When they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought they already received that. No, they hadn't. They just received the first two baptisms. This is a different experience because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had just simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. So I'm just trying to show you that God, God has a journey that he wants to take you on. And in my personal opinion, I believe the devil has just scared so many people out of, out of something that is so pure and so beautiful and so powerful, like there is nothing freaky or weird or spooky about it. God just wants to empower you. He wants to submerge you. He wants to fully submerge and immerse you into his spirit. I want to show you one more verse just to let you see again how real this is in your Bible. Like, like from cover to cover, this is the journey. This is the journey that God desires for you. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse 7 through 8. It says, for there are three that bear witness. Where? In heaven. These three bear witness in heaven. Who are they? Say them with me. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. So what is the Word? Well, the Word is, is John's favorite term for Jesus, John 1.1, 1, 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word dwelt among man, became flesh. This is Jesus. So this is the Trinity right here. There are three that bear witness, the Trinity in heaven. But then he says, there are also three that bear witness, not in heaven. Where is this one? On earth, there are three that bear witness on earth. What are they? The spirit, the water, and the blood. Well, what is that? That's the three baptisms right there. That's the blood. That's your salvation experience by the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the water. The water is the second baptism, water baptism, and the spirit. That's the spirit, the, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm just like, this is, it's all through your, in fact, it's even in your Old Testament. 
You, you learned last week that, that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it, that there are these shadows and types in the Old Testament. And last week, you, you remember the tabernacles, the portable church of God? Well, in this tabernacle, there was the Ark of the Covenant, and there was actually three layers that you had to go through in order to get to the presence of God where the Ark of the Covenant was. And these three things, you probably already guessed it, are a type and a shadow of the three journeys and experiences of immersion that God has for you. I'm telling you, it's all throughout your Bible. Some of you ought to study this. So the first one, let me just tell you, the first one was the brazen altar. That's where the sacrifice was made. The blood was shed. Okay, that represents the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Then you would go into the second, the second layer of the tabernacle, and that was the laver of water that the priest would wash his hands in. What does that represent? The water baptism. And then you go into the third layer, and there, inside there, there was, there was a candle of oil that they would light, and that represents the Holy Spirit. And then you would go in into the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant. I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm trying to just convince you guys that there is so much more to your Christian experience, to your life. Like there is, there is more than just salvation. God has the, these immersions for you. All of them are for you. And I'm just trying to help you see them today. So let, let's answer this question then, like why? why? Why be baptized in the Holy Spirit? I mean, if, I, if it gives, like just a relationship with God gives me heaven, then why baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you why. Because God always intended for you to live a spirit-empowered life. He never, he never intended for you to, to live your life by your own efforts, by your own strength, by your own intellect. He never intended the church to operate without the power, the presence. He always intended signs and wonders to follow his word. And I, I mean, it's, it, it just you were never, you were always designed by God to live with boldness and with power. And I believe that the packaging that it's come in has turned a lot of people away. And I, I call it the abuse and the misuse of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Holy Spirit. So much abuse has happened in the name of the Holy Spirit. And misuse has happened in the name of the Holy Spirit. And most people say, well, I don't want that. Well, can I tell you, like, I don't want that either. There's some of that that I just, I just don't want to have anything to do with it. But I think sometimes we throw the baby out with the bath water. And God designed you to live a spirit-empowered life. Not under your own ability. With the gifts of God in full operation. The power of God. Like, I, I always dreamed of a church, actually, that, that, that fully embraced Pentecost and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but wasn't goofy or weird or turned people off. And, and like, it, I, but, but when people would come in, they wouldn't see, like, what in the world is going on with these people. They would actually come in and say, wow, God is here. Like an authentic encounter with God. And we need his power, I'm telling you, to live out the mission he has for us. I remember when I first started studying the Holy Spirit myself, because I was, um, when I first, well, when I really committed my life to Christ, there was a spirit-filled church that I was a part of, and there were some, there were some people in that church that was, it was a Pentecostal church, like an old school Pentecostal church, and there was just some people that, I honestly, I'll just be honest with you guys, it just turned me off. I was like, I don't want that, you know, I'm good with, I'm good with this far, I'm good, you know, and, and I just did, but, but it hurt me, it hurt my spiritual life. I had disconnected from friends and relationship and scenes and stuff because I was doing drugs and doing stuff, and I knew I couldn't be around that stuff, and I, I separated myself, but I, can I just be honest with you, it got hard. It got, it got hard because I was doing it by my own strength, and, a, and, and I, I knew I had God with me, but it was, I just, I was like, I liken it to a wet piece of toilet paper, drag it on the ground. Okay? I was just like, like limp, okay, at one point. And I remember just, you know, I was in my room, and I, and I asked, and you guys know my story. Some of you like, know my story. I asked the Holy Spirit, okay, Holy Spirit, come in, come in, come in me then, all right? But, don't, but then I said, but don't make me like, you know, so-and-so. <laughs> But don't you don't do me like her. Don't be don't, and and I honestly what I said was, Holy Spirit, come in, but you better behave yourself. That's what I told him. And I'm saying, and and obviously it just I continued to kind of just struggle with like living in victory. And and uh and it would just it just got to the point where I just I started studying the word of God myself, what the holy what what God says about the Holy Spirit in the Bible says. And what I discovered was he is not weird. There's nothing weird about him. There wasn't he wasn't like even spooky at all, like he's good. Power, he wants to empower me, counsel me, direct me, and guide me, and fill me, and empower me, and gift me. I said, come on then, Holy Spirit. 
I told him, I said, I got in my room. I was in my room. I was all alone. And I was like, come on, baby. Come on, Holy Spirit. Do whatever you got to do. And God gave me a beautiful prayer language that I use every day of my life. And I have, I have no way of explaining like how this felt, you guys. But the best way I can explain it is that, that something stood up on the inside of me. Just like a, it was like a man stood up on the inside of me, and I got filled with boldness and power, and I was witnessing to everybody. My friends were getting saved. I was doing street ministry. God would give me prophetic words for people. People would be carrying alcohol beverages in there, and I just, God would speak to me. I'd give them a word, and they'd drop the bags crying and go home. It was just, and anytime the doors were open in the church, I was there. If they were studying, if there was a Bible study, if there was an event, I was there. It's like Peter, you know, when... Peter couldn't even witness to a little girl calling him out, you know, when, before. But then after Pentecost and he got filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit, he stands up and preaches and 3,000 people get saved. I just can't, I cannot explain to you how, I, I just, I believe that so many people are living under the calling. We're living under the destiny because of the way maybe it's been taught to us or packaged to us. And, and I mean, I'm not weird. Am I weird? Don't answer that question, okay? But... <laughs> But this is, I'm just, it's for you. It's, my hope is that you won't resist the Holy Spirit because every good and perfect gift comes from God. It comes from above, and he's got great things in store for you, but it's beyond what your mind can understand. And here's my hope for you. Ephesians chapter 5. Here's my encouragement out of Ephesians. It says, don't get drunk on wine. What's interesting is the Bible actually, it, it, it admits the fact that you, you're, you were created for this, and you in your soul will crave something like this. You will, cra- you will crave to get drunk on wine or to get some type of high or get some type of experience. Or to, you, want, you, you were created for this. And so you will crave something. And he says, look, don't get drunk in wine because that just leads to debauchery. You know what that means? It means a life out of control. Does that sound familiar to anyone? I know it did for me. And he says, instead, here's the answer, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the answer you need. That's the solution your soul is craving for, your life is craving for. Okay, pastor, you convinced me. How do I do it? Okay, great. I'm glad you guys asked. You guys are ready for this. Here, Let me give you a few steps that you can take and just begin to invite the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Here it is. Take some notes. Number one, first thing we got to do is remove all the barriers. Remove all the barriers. Now, every, there, you may have different barriers. There, there may be some doctrinal barriers that some of you have, some, some theological things that have been told to you, and maybe we need to just remove those things. Some of you, it's bad experiences or packaging that you need to remove those barriers, man. You need to cast down those strongholds that are preventing you from this relationship and immersion with the Holy Spirit. Some of you, what you need to remove, a barrier is, is a barrier of sin. Some of you, you're still holding on to something, and you know it, and that's why you really can't jump in and fully immerse yourself into God is because you still got one hand in the world, or maybe one hand of the world's got you, whichever way you, you want to put it. But here's how Peter puts it on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 says, Peter replied, repent, like turn from, turn from your sin. And that, that's the first baptism right there, repent, and be baptized. That's the second baptism. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Hey, church, the promise is for who? It's for you. Hey, the promise is for us, church. It's for our children and for all who are far off. You're not far. You're not too far away from God for this, for his power, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So that's step number one. And I don't know what your barrier is. Or whatever, but we need to remove those things if you want to be immersed and baptized in the Holy Spirit. Here's the second thing that we need to do, and that is request the gift of the Holy Spirit. I just, just ask Him. Like, request it. Ask Him. It's a gift. It, you cannot earn this. You cannot, you don't deserve this. There's nothing you can do for this. You can't say hallelujah a hundred times and get it, okay? That's just, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. Just request, the, ask. This is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. If you then, though you're evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who simply ask him? Okay, and, it, and by the way, can I say, it doesn't have to look like what you think it looks like. 
And see, that's what some of you are afraid of. That's why you don't ask them, or maybe that's part of the barrier. Because so, some people say, oh, when you get filled with the Spirit, then you do this, and it looks like this. You get baptized in the Holy Spirit, and it looks like this. Can I just tell you, anytime you do that, it just irks me. Anytime you do that, you put a works on, on, the, on the gift of the Holy Spirit, on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Can I just tell you what is a, is a better um, testimony, is a better outward evidence of you being filled and baptized with the Holy Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said you'll know them by their what? By their fruit. Galatians chapter 5 tells us what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus says, you know what? If you're full of the Spirit, man, you're going to bear fruit of the Spirit. Look at any of that, all of that, it's available to you. All of that can be available to you in 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 a full measure Ask him for it. You say, Pastor, is it that easy? Yes. Yes, it really is. It's that easy. He's a good father. He's good. I remember um, shortly after that experience in my room where just God just met me and encountered me right there and baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Months, uh, several months later, I got deployed. I was, uh, I was in the Navy for five years, and I got deployed. And I, was, I was in training in North Carolina at Camp Lejeune, and I was in my room a barracks where there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of people. There's a rec room and everything like that. I remember my room was studying the, the Bible. And, and I had one of those moments with God that we talked about where, where the whisper of the Holy Spirit to your heart where he says, hey, this is the way. Walk in it. I had one of those moments. It was so beautiful. And, and, and the Holy Spirit, as I was studying, just whispered to me. He said, Jason, go to the rec room. I have a job for you. And I just knew. It was so, con- it was, I was studying. Like, Boy, where did that come? I knew it was God. And, and by the way, this was the day after 9-11 the day after. And so um, I got up, went over to the rec room and walked in there. There was nine Marines um, watching a big screen TV and they were watching the news and just the, this scene of planes hitting the World Trade Towers and them coming down. And I'm standing in the back just watching like, God, what do you want me to do here? And one of the Marines over here said, does this mean it's the end times? And it was almost in unison. They all turned their heads and looked at me in the back of the room. <laughs> and, I just, and I just step into that moment, and I minister to them and share the gospel with them, and all nine of them get saved. And, and I'm just, look, you guys. And so I get back to my room, and I call my wife. And, and Veronica's been in, in church her whole life. She's, she's a Christian. She was a part of you know, a, a spirit-filled church and environment her whole life. But, but she was turned off by what I like to call weirdism. You know, it was just, it just was, let me be honest, it was just weird, okay? So she was, that was a barrier for her, and she was turned off by that. And I call her, I said, honey, you won't believe what just happened, man, God spoke to me, and I went in there, and, this was, and I'm just telling her, and you know what she said? She said, that's not fair! How come God is speaking to you like this and using you? And I've been in church my whole life. And, and she just began to explain, like, I don't get it, man. And she, she had not yet experienced this immersion and this empowerment and this boldness yet. And she said, man, I want that. She, why? Why? And, then I, and you know what? I really, because I used to be a heathen. That's what it is. And she was, she was like raised up in church. I honestly think sometimes it's just better to be jacked up heathen and not come with a baggage of religion. <laughs> That, that sometimes religion will mess you up, man. It just mess you up and bind you. She was, anyway, anyway, I'm sorry, I digress. So let me go back. So I'm talking to her, about, and, and, and the Holy Spirit just started speaking to me, this stuff right here, and I said, I said, honey, I think, I, I think because you were raised in that environment, you have some barriers of what it looks like and doesn't look like, and you have some walls that are up, and what you need to do is just ask him. You think it's supposed to look like something. Just ask him. It's a gift. You already have it in your hands. Just unwrap the gift. And that's, and that's where you get point number three here, where I told him number three, receive him now by faith. Like you have to, by faith, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't like this part about God, but it's true. It's just how God rolls, okay? Anytime God has something for you, he's going he's gonna to cause you to take a leap. He just is. I'm just telling you, this is the way God is. God, God, every experience that God has for you will cause you to take a leap of faith. It'll, he, he, will, he will cause you to kind of like enter into like this risky, a risk zone or something. And, and the reason why is he's trying to get you outside of yourself. He's trying to get you outside of your ability, your power. He's trying to get you to a new realm of the supernatural. That's what he's trying to do. And don't get freaked out by that word. I'm just, I, the supernatural is just natural plus God. That's it. That's what he wants. He just wants you plus him. That's, it's a supernatural life. And God is inviting you 
a lot of you today to just take one more step. Just, just one more step. And I love this, this prophecy. It's a beautiful picture of the, of the spiritual life and the spiritual journey that God has for us in Ezekiel chapter 47. I mean, I just love this prophecy. It's, it's a picture of our spiritual journey and our spiritual life. Look at it with me. It says, as a man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits, and then he led me into a, into a spiritual experience through the water, but I was only willing to go, he says, ankle deep. And that's where some of you are today. You're like, well, I don't want to get wet, but I don't want to go to hell either. <laughs> so I put my toe in the water. So I just go, I'm just going to go ankle, ankle deep. And, and by the way, again, can I tell you, if you have Jesus, all you need is ankle deep to go to heaven. That's it. I'll be honest with you. But there's more, church. There is so much more to your life. There is so much more to your relationship with God. There is so much more than just one day going to heaven. Like God has so much more for your life. And then he says he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was knee deep. And by the way, some of you even did that today or sometime recently. When you first came to Discovery, you're like, I'm not raising my hands anymore. No, I'm not. But you've been here for a little while. And, and, and you know, during worship, the third song kind of got on you a little bit. And you were like, what, 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 yo, and you, you just went there, and, and by, like last week, I had, there was this, one lady told me, one girl told me, she, she was so excited, she said, pastor, I, last, last time in worship, I didn't only raise one hand, I raised two hands in worship, I was like, get it, girl, come on, man, get into that water, some of you, you guys, you guys are in like the, the needy, but there's more, there's more, the Bible says, uh, he measured off another thousand, and led me through water, that was up to the ways. And I want you to just notice that all three, all three of these experiences are, they're like, I'm wet, but I'm still in control. My feet are still on the bottom of the bedrock. I mean, I mean, here I can feel the current when it's hitting me in the waist, but I'm a little, and I can even feel it pulling me in further, but I just know if I go further, man, I lose, the river will take me. The current will take me and I will lose my, my footing my control. And then he says, he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I couldn't even cross because the water had risen too deep for anyone enough to swim. And, and, and he goes on, Ezekiel goes on, and he says, there in the middle of the river, the Spirit of God is there. And that water is teeming with life. Like the best stuff that God has to offer is in the middle of the river. And I just believe that some of you are in some of those stages today where you want to get wet, but you want to be in control. And I just, I, you want your feet on the ground. And I'm just, I just want to encourage you wherever you're at in that experience, just to take one more step into the river. Because listen, if your feet are constantly on the ground in your relationship with Jesus, then I just be really honest with you guys. I love you. And I want to be honest with you. You can't really live a life that pleases God if your feet are always on the ground. Look what Hebrews says, chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith, without that leap, Without that risk, without that step where I need to trust in God, he said it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that not only he exists, but he rewards those who passionately pursue him, who earnestly seek him. And please listen to me, guys. Listen, God is patient. He's not in a rush with you. He don't need you like to... Take it all in and just, just go from ankle to waist and swim it all. No, no, no. He's so patient. I believe all he's asking to do is take a step. He said, just go on this journey with him. There is more. There is this an immersion into a relationship with Christ and the body of Christ. And there is, there is a time where he'll call you deeper and say, go public, my son. Go public. Like, live for me. Honor me. And then he'll call you even to a deeper because he's got a mission and a plan for you. He wants you to live a spirit-empowered life life, and it's for you. He's patient. I'm just saying, take a step today so you can do number four, and that is you can relate to him daily. Daily relate to the Holy Spirit. Like, like the Holy Spirit's not weird, you guys. He's not. Listen, the Holy Spirit is my best friend. He's my counselor. He's my guide. He's my advocate. He's my director. He's, he is not weird. Don't stir just yet, you guys, because I want to pray for you in just a moment. Every day, every day, invite the power of the Holy Spirit into your life. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. Here's what I, my prayer for you. It says, the amazing grace 
of the master, Jesus Christ. That's the first baptism. The extravagant love of God. And this is my prayer for you. The intimate, that you would build an intimate friendship with the Holy Spirit. Come on, let's bow our heads. Close our eyes and let's not stir this moment. Church, help me pray.